Right. Hello, everybody, and hello, everybody here. Uh, nice to see so many people show up on a hot, summery day, right? Um, we acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people, which include the Ottawa, Ojibwe, the Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We also acknowledge the Wendat Huron, Wendat Nation, Huron, who occupied these lands prior to the middle of the 17th century. We are dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture and recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on this land. <laughs> we are committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect and with, first, uh, with all First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. So welcome everyone uh, to April 13th Word Up. We are doing a flash fiction panel before we uh, go ahead to the open mic. Um, so anyone online, please make sure that your, your, mic, uh, your mics are muted. <laughs> um, tonight we're talking with uh, Bruce Meyer and a multidisciplinary artist and writer, Lynn Hutchinson Lee, about writing flash fiction. Um, we're going to ask a few panel questions uh, before we open the floor to your questions and then open mic. Um, so first, we're going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves, and then we'll start with the panel. So Lynn, tell us about yourself. Um, about myself. Well, um, I was born in Toronto and grew up in the countryside, um, what is now Thornhill, used to be quite um, beautiful land and uh, trees, forests, streams, fields, but very conservative. So my family, which was not particularly conservative, um, uh, had some some difficulties adjusting. But um, anyway, that that's the way it was. So I grew up there and went to school there. And uh, my parents were both artists. And they were both very involved in um, in um, human rights issues and campaigns. And when I was about 18, I uh, ended up in, in Toronto, dropping out of University of Toronto, uh, then dropping out of Ontario College of Art, <laughs> then at 40, going back to University of Toronto, dropping out of that. <laughs> so I've, I've kind of, I've graduated from high school, but that's about it. Um, I've been an artist um, most of my adult life uh, for the past uh, 50 odd years. And uh, recently I began to write. And I was um, actually quite delighted. Here is Bruce beside me who, who uh, accepted a story for the uh, um, Fly, Fly, Fly Fly Canadian Tales of Climate Change oh, anthology Anna. published by Exile. And that was, that was really my first big introduction to, um, to writing. Although in uh, 2011, I did um, a poem based on, um, on my father's life as a sound installation for the Roma Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. And that kind of, and then I was lazy for a few years. And then I, <laughs> I, uh, I started writing again and uh, acceptance into that, um, into that anthology actually gave me the impetus yeah. to be a little bit more serious about my writing. So, um, but I've never really studied anything formally. Um, so it's, um, I'm really kind of in, in writing kindergarten. I still consider myself quite early at the end of my life in this, uh, in this, um, this endeavor. So I think that's about it. That brings us up to the present. <laughs> <laughs> and Bruce. Hi, um, I'm Bruce Meyer. And, uh, I don't know, I've been writing all my life as long as I can remember. And uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I've been told I write too much. I suffer from hypergraphia. And <laughs> um, I've done 70, some 70 plus books. And uh, I had a liver, it's the reason I'm wearing a mask. I had a liver transplant last summer. And uh, I said to my wife when I was recovering from the liver transplant from having my catalytic converter changed, um, that um, uh, I said I'll never write. I have I've, I've I'll never write again and all that stuff. And while I was in the hospital, books started appearing in the mail, 
and I have no, I had no idea that that I'd sent them out. Um, so uh, one of the books was uh, this this one, uh, Flashes in the Dark. It was done by Mosaic, and they did a nice job on it, considering that the, all the author did was write it, you know. Um, <laughs> and um, the uh, so, anyways, the I I write. Um, I'm not writing at the moment. Um, I decided to take a hiatus. Uh, I'm talking now, and I'm looking forward to returning to teaching because I teach at Georgian College. And uh, I don't know. Was there anything else I should add? That's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> good to see you all here. See you. Yeah. So this will be Bruce's first uh, writing hiatus since he could use crayons, probably. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's my first public event since I had the transplant last mm -hmm. night. So, and sign your donor card. I nice. Recommend it. I urge you to do that. Okay, so we're going to start off with our uh, flash fiction writing panel. Um, so the first question, my research from a variety of sources state flash fiction is anywhere from 50 to 100 words, while microfiction is anywhere from six words to 60. So how and why do you define flash fiction? And does it need to be firmly, does it need need to be firmly defined? Um, let's go with you, Lynn, you wanna start? Um, I don't know, um, I'm not very good at defining things, but um, I would say, I'm not sure where these arbitrary numbers come from. I expect they're very useful to editors of, of journals and anthologies, but also mm -hmm. I think, um, um, it's useful for a writer who really wants to uh, compress their writing and to edit it ferociously until it shines like a jewel. Um, so I can see that there are very important reasons to limit the word count. Um, the shorter it gets, the harder it gets, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. I think... Defining things is, I mean, I, I, I'm an academic, so um, I'm supposed to define things, and then I start thinking about it, and I think, that's tosh. You know, I mean, who, who, who invented that rule? Um, and one of the things I like to do as a writer is to see what I can do without, and if you think about it, Shakespeare's Hamlet um, is, what's Hamlet about? Well, it's about three and a half hours of a guy moping around on the stage. <laughs> And Aristotle defines six constituent elements of drama, and they're plot, character, thought, diction, spectacles, and song. And then Shakespeare comes along and says, gee, I wonder what I can do without. So if you look at Hamlet, he goes without plot. There's it, nothing happens in Hamlet. And then you're sitting there going, come on, you know, do something. You know, um, anything interesting happens off stage, you know. Um, uh, uh, Plot, character, got lots of character. Uh, thought, all Hamlet does is think, you know. <laughs> and then you got diction, which is the lang you know, language and so forth. And um, the spectacle, well, there's no spectacle at the end, except the, the sword fight. And the sword fight is kind of like a, isn't really a sword fight. You know, the original the precursor Hamlet uh, uh, play had involved meat. It involved dinner. It involved people throwing, you know, uh, sausages into the audience and everything. <laughs> um, it, it was spectacle, but um, you know, uh, but there's no spectacle, and it's kind of like anticlimactic. And um, song, well, the only song you get is Ophelia's Mad Song, and it's kind of it's it's an anti-song in many ways. So when you get right down to it, what's Hamlet about? Was about three and a half hours long, and if you think about it, it just it's it, you, this is the way writers work. You look at what you can do without. Mm. And I, I, I said in, in the interview that uh, Linda shared with a number of people on Facebook, um, that uh, writing flash fiction is like hot air ballooning. You're looking at what you, it only works and only flies when you start throwing things overboard. And you, there's some things you can't do without, like like words, and you can't do without, do without articles and verbs and things like that. But you, otherwise, there's a lot of stuff you can leave out. And if you look at it, a lot of writing is padding. And it makes for lousy academic essays, and it makes for lousy flash fiction. And I'm not saying the flash fiction is anywhere near an academic essay, but you should, when you're writing flash fiction, you should try to make sure that you 
uh, pare it down to the point where you know you're looking at the at the bare minimum. Um, and you can do a lot with more. Less is more is the sort of the model of flash fiction. So yeah, and the idea with flash fiction is it has to be very short, yeah. but it has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end yeah. at the very least. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what makes it challenging. And you have to uh, adhere to the rules of fiction. I mean, um, th th there's things that you, that you have at your disposal, all the elements of fiction, if you want to call them that. Character, you know, you got um, you know, setting, you've got, you know, tension and so forth. But beyond that, you know, you can play with all those things. And I, I tell my students, when you're writing something, play with the ideas, play with the language, play with the, what, the structure and everything like that. There's no, nothing that says you got to do it this way. You, you, can, you invent your own methodology, you invent your own system, you know. Or as William Blake said, I must invent my own system or be imprisoned by another man. You know, invent your own system, you know, within every piece of writing. And, you know, away you go. So, anyways. Good. So, Bruce says, make your own rules. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's my flash fiction uh, yeah. answer to your yeah. answer. <laughs> okay. So, the line between flash fiction and prose poetry has been the subject of much debate. As an example, um, and for those of you online, I can share a link maybe later on. Uh, there's something called The Colonel by Carolyn Forche. It has been published in both poetry and a flash fiction anthology. Uh, so where do you think the line is drawn? And do you think it's important as, an, as a distinction? My turn. Yeah. Um, I don't know if a line can be drawn. Um, but because I think words slide into whatever framework is waiting for them and to and, and to whatever framework those words need. But interestingly enough, I think the character of writing changes when you move it from poetry into into um, prose or vice versa. Uh, the rhythm changes, the emotion changes, all the feelings change. Um, and the mood is uh, is particularly changed. And I think uh, uh, somebody referred to the prose version as opposed to a poetic version as being less um, emotionally loaded. Um, and I'm not sure if that's true. I'll have to think about that. I only heard it yesterday. But um, the I read uh, The Colonel by Carolyn Forche, which I thought was a pretty extraordinary piece of writing. Um, and I'm thinking that um, one example I can I can remember of flash fiction and poetry with the same content is a, a flash fiction story by Ursula Flug, the writer who, um, from her collection, Seeds and Other Stories, the fiction story called Castorides. Um, I've seen it both in flash fiction and in poetry, in prose poetry, and I can attest to the fact that it feels different when you read it um, in either fiction or or as uh, poetry. So uh, I think it, it's really interesting how, how you can transpose a piece of writing from one place um, to another and get completely different responses, emotional responses to that work. So um, I don't know uh, where the line is in all of that. Again, I think um, lines are not necessarily um, a part of the the writing experience, for me at least, or the reading experience. Yeah. I remember reading the Colonel years ago and um, thinking, well, <clears throat> this 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 is an interesting piece that blurs distinctions. Um, Porsche is is a poet by nature, and I think she's also taking something from Robert Bly. Robert Bly years ago, Bly did a poem called "The Seal." about a seal dying on a beach that he discovers and so forth. And, um, he sort of ruined it when he read it at Harper because he was playing the bazooki at the time. And uh, <laughs> it was like, you know, the seal looked at me blah, 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 like that, and he couldn't play the bazooki. So, um, but the, the whole point was that, that um, I think poets are drawn or writers are drawn to flash fiction because of the no nature of something called the prose poem. And I could, remember looking at, um, at uh, Porsche's poem. And you can actually break it into lines. 
if you stop at every object noun, and which is one of the principles of free verse, you break the line of the, of the object noun, and then you bring it again the next line with the subject noun and break it up the object noun. And guess what? She's got an iambic ear, which is kind of interesting. You can't take the poet out of the out of the prose. And Keats said, "Good poetry approximates prose." And Al McLeod, Alistair McLeod, the Canadian writer, said, "Good prose approximates poetry." And it's something that writers notice is this distinction. It's the need for uh, cadence, not just sound, but there's a kind of natural rising and falling of a voice that is at work both in prose and also in, in, in poems. Uh, my wife was complaining over dinner that my when I read, my poems all sound the same. Um, and it, it, maybe it's because there is the, there's a kind of an underlying principle called the endophone, which is the sound of the book poet's voice that can't be taken from the poem. But there's a, a presence in the poem which is naturally musical. We all possess that natural music. And it, it creeps into prose poetry and it creeps into the, uh, the flash fiction. And if you're going to make your the difference between a flash fiction story that falls flat and one that actually goes somewhere, isn't the flash fiction poem sounds different. Or a sound, flash fiction story sounds, has some music to it. Um, have any of you read Elizabeth Smart's by Grand Central Station? I sat down and wept. No, it, it was a, a novel of the 19, late 1930s. And uh, her um, Lester B. Pearson burned it in the garden of the Canadian Embassy. I won't go into that story, but it's a long story. But uh, her, her mother was upset. Mm -hmm. so, um, but the whole point was that um, Greg Gatenby was dismissing it, the guy who ran Harborfront for years, was dismissing uh, Elizabeth Smart as a writer. And he says, that's a paltry prose poem. It's not a paltry prose poem. Listen to the beautiful music in her language. She's writing a novel. And the no each, each chapter of the novel is essentially an extended flash fiction. And you suddenly look at it and you think, oh, you got a novella in flash here, Elizabeth. And if I'd known more about flash when I knew Elizabeth Smart, I would have put that question to her. Uh, but it's not a paltry prose poem. You can tell the, that she understands that language, whether it's communicating in prose or it's communicating in poetic lines, is essentially inherently musical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's good. I want to make okay. sure you're done. <laughs> I'm never sure. <laughs> so the next uh, question is a little more personal. Uh, when did you discover flash fiction? Uh, and who are your favorite writers and what makes them your favorites? You want to start, Bruce? Yeah, I got my bell rung. Um, I, I was in a car accident in 2016. And I have no recollection of getting out and shouting at the guys who, the teenagers who rammed us. Um, but I had a head injury and I was carted off to the hospital. Uh, my wife wrecked her knee in the same accident. And um, I, I woke up in RVH and I couldn't read for about uh, oh, three or four weeks. And I had to teach. I had to get back to teaching at Georgian. And the students, I'd say, to, I'd put up the flat of uh, the, the PowerPoint and say, tell me what that says. <laughs> you know, and they'd read it out loud. And I said, yes. You know, sort of thing. Um, I needed to get control of language again. And the way I brought myself back into language again was by writing flash fiction. It's narrative in a short space. It's telling a story. It's starting at point A and going to, you know, the Z or wherever you want to leave off. It's contained, it's containment in a very uh, sophisticated way where I was made to be selective. And selectivity is one of the things that defines craft. You know, it's, um, you know, it, it's not complication, it's selectivity. And um, I, so I started writing flash fiction. And, um, you know, I, I I got into it at that point, and then I started publishing things and um, corresponding with flash fiction writers. And um, I just thought this is kind of cool. But flash fiction had not quite become a phenomenon at that point. There was a, a, a writer by the name of John McGregor. We were talking about uh, flash fiction writers mm -hmm. that were, were mm -hmm. like, "This is John McGregor." May I read? It's yeah. a very short, short piece. Absolutely. Um, I've always admired this one. It's called "That Color." 
She stood by the window and said, those trees are turning that beautiful color again. Is that right, I asked. It was the back of the house, in the kitchen. I was doing the dishes. The water wasn't hot enough. She said, I don't know what color you'd call it. There were the trees on the other side of the road she was talking about, across the junction. It's a wonder they do so well where they are with the traffic. I don't know what they are. Some kind of maple or sycamore, perhaps. This happens every year, and she always seems taken by surprise. These years get shorter every year. She said, I could look at them all day. I really could. I rested my hands in the water and listened to her standing there, her breathing. She didn't say anything. She kept standing there. I emptied the bowl and refilled it with hot water. The room was cold, and the steam poured out of the water and off the dishes. I could feel it on my face. She said, they're not just red. That's not it, um, it, it, it is, is it now? I rinsed off the frying pan and ran my fingers around it to check for grease. My knuckles were starting to ache again and already. She said, when you close your eyes on a sunny day, it's a bit like that color. Her voice was quiet. I stood still and listened. She said, it's hard to describe. A lorry went past and the whole house shook uh, with it and I heard her step away from the window. The way she does. I asked her, I asked her why she was so surprised. I told her it was autumn. It was what happened. The days get shorter. The chlorophyll breaks down. The leaves turn a different color. I told her she went through this every year. She said, it's just lovely. They're lovely. That's all. You don't have to. I finished the dishes and poured out the water and rinsed the bowl. There, uh, there was a very red skirt she used to wear when, she, uh, when we were young. She dyed her hair to match it once, and some people in the town were moved by, to comment. Flame red, she called it then. Perhaps these leaves were like that, the ones she was trying to describe. I dried my hands uh, and went through the front room um, and stood beside her. I felt her, for her hand and held it. But... Tell me again. That's the story. Um, it's like it's describing things. It's a story about stories in some ways, but it's, it's, it's you don't have to do a lot. That's the nice thing. It's, it's selectivity, which is at the root of it. So, anyways, that, yeah. yeah. So when, when did I discover flash fiction? Yeah around the time of the pandemic. Um, I was uh, um, working on a painting because I'm also a painter. And I was out in the country in a little house at, uh, on my, in my daughter's field. And um, not much was going on except painting, no internet or very sketchy internet, not a lot of, um, of stimulation and I was, uh, when I wasn't painting, I began to turn to just writing little bits of things down, um, not with any particular agenda in mind, but more to just capture my feelings, the experiences of, of the moment. Um, so that was really important for me. So that's when I, um, when I, or maybe more likely where flash fiction discovered me, and I was um, I was instantly captivated because it seems to me that during the pandemic things really became very condensed and uh, became very focused and it felt as I've had a need to um, respond to that and writing flash fiction did that for me it just took all these words and just sort of compressed them into this and it's it worked it felt very good so I began to read flash fiction and um, I guess around that time um, uh, uh, Guernica put out a call for flash fiction stories edited by Bruce and Michael Marola and I thought well I'll take a stab at this and um, so I wrote I just started writing stories and writing stories and editing them down and condensing them and 
and pulling my favorite words out and putting new words in, simplifying. And um, so I was very pleased to get these uh, some of these stories accepted in, in the uh, anthology. Um, so flash fiction was essentially quite new to me. Um, as far as, as favorite um, uh, writers, um, one person I really admire is Karen Schauber, who in her work, she always has a subtle little flash of light at the very end, which I think is where the idea of flash comes from. You're, you come into a story in the middle of it, and then you um, uh, then when you get to the end, suddenly there's a little surprise. It feels like a whole novel compressed into this small, intense space. Um, and I remember uh, reading uh, a story of yours, Bruce, called In Place, which has stayed with me since I first read it. Duck, yeah. yeah, about a man who wants to save ducks from a frozen pond. But by saving them, he then releases them into the air to be shot by hunters. And um, to me, that answered something that, that is important uh, for me in Flash is there's the story under the story. A Flash is so small, but it's the size of the universe. And then underneath that Flash, there's a whole other story that might hit you uh, a day or a week or a month later. And that's what that story did for me. I, I, I'm still very moved by it. Um, and I do revisit it sometimes. Um, another a uh, book that I've just been reading, which is actually, um, I would say it's a novella in Flash, even though it's not intended to be Flash, called The Incident Report by Martha Bailey, a librarian. And she, do you know that I book? Know, I know Martha, yeah. Yeah, well. I remember she was working on it. Yeah. Oh, well, it, yeah. it, it is absolutely extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. It's, um, and I don't think she she described it as Flash. It was written, what, in 2009? Yeah, she was she was working as a librarian. It's, yeah, she still is. Yeah. She still is. Yeah. 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 And so it's the account of uh, of of what a librarian has to do in, in this in this fiction, which is um, document incidents that happen. And so what happens is it 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 has a whole narrative that that builds into this uh, uh, these experiences weaving in and out of her of her life as a librarian you know, terrifying things happening, hilarious things happening. And during the course of this, she finds a lover. And these two rather lonely, quiet people come together um, and it builds to a catastrophic and very distressing finish, but it didn't take away from the joy and beauty of reading it. So I would say those were flashes. The chapters were very short. Yeah, I seem to recall talking to her about it because she was starting to write it and mm -hmm. she came to the Leacock Festival. Mm. And I mentioned to her that Naipaul had written a story called The Night Watchman's Occurrence Book, mm -hmm. which is a series of, it's a night watchman at a hotel. Mm -hmm. And he's supposed to leave a record for the owner of the hotel who comes mm -hmm. on the days. Mm -hmm. And, but the night watchman is totally elliptical. I mean, he's his, uh, oh, the, the room four caught fire, everything fell. You know, and it's sort of like, what? <laughs> you know? And it's um, it, it's it's a it's a very funny story, but I think I think I, I I gather she must have taken a look at it because it's like a diary, you know, it's like an incident report, right? So, anyways, but uh, so if you want to see an interesting antecedent, take a look at the night. I think I will. I think I will. Yeah. I was really captivated by this book. Anybody who's interested in librarians, I kind of am because I know a few. Um, but it was also the voice that was so tender and so humble in a way and each word is like a jewel it's it's marvelous i like meg pokras too but i'm really um martha bailey is uh i think to me a more satisfying writer so and yeah, meg pokras okay. writes a lot more dogs and she's got uh, one book that i have is uh, the dog looks entirely different upside down oh really yeah and i decided to Take her to word. I can remember lying on the floor <laughs> and my dog <laughs> thinking, oh, I, I should see it. You go, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So dogs are friends, look friendly there upside down. Yeah. I haven't tried that experiment. Yeah. <laughs> I might have to do that with my cat. 
<laughs> the same. It will it stay still long enough. Well, Winston, he's, he's very, yeah, he's pretty <laughs> cool. He's pretty chill. So you guys have um, kind of answered this question. What made you take up the challenge of writing short fiction? Um, but do you believe honing your skills in micro and flash fiction uh, will improve writing overall, your writing or other people's? I, I want to write longer short stories. And sorry, what was that? No, it's okay. I wanted to write longer short stories and um, I thought, well, if I write some flashes and I just keep going, then I'll get a longer short story. And it worked in some cases. Um, so you, you might find that the flashes that you write are the kernel of something else. And the other ones just seem to want to be the moment. And um, so, you know, and you can't press them, take them in stride. But uh, you, you might, I mean, there's a, quite a few longer short stories of mine that have actually begun as flashes. So, hmm. Uh, the challenge of writing short fiction. Well, I grew up with folk tales and fairy tales, and in particular, Russian fairy tales, which are quite wonderful and magical. And I actually, as a child, believed they were real, even though I knew they weren't. Um, uh, but the the interesting thing about these stories was I entered a world. I entered a completely different world, and I would usually retell these stories to myself at night. And then, of course, I really did enter another world. And writing flash fiction is like that for me. It creates a portal that you step through into another world. It's very different than writing a short story or writing anything else. It's really a portal into another world, sort of a, a very a, a shining, glowing, dark world. And um, I found that, uh, that it was, um, how can I say this? Um, I found that 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 flash was the one thing that I that I did in in my life as an artist slash writer that really took me through into another world, and it's really more like a journey into the interior, not necessarily to an outer world, but you're also going into the interior as well. So there was that, um, and I uh, I'd always wanted to write. And as I mentioned, my first um, really big experience was was a uh, prose poem for sound installation. And um, that also took me into another world. I was talking about the life of my father as a child in England. And um, I entered his world through that prose poem, which I think could be rewritten as Flash. But um, yeah, do your skills in honing your skills in micro and flash writing, improve your writing overall. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you learn to be ruthless and sometimes you have to be ruthless and you have to edit and, and chop away at something to uh, like cutting a diamond, I would think. Same thing. My yeah. wife taught me to be ruthless. <laughs> he would get a hold of my short stories and say, can you proofread it? And proofreading was in fact, kind of like the barber who doesn't stop at the hair you know? <laughs> and um it would just get it get shorter and shorter and shorter mm -hmm. but she, she worked in news she was a she was a writer for television and the evening news at cbc and everything like that and you, if you take a look at news broadcasts the items are all a minute and ten and the canadian theory of news is you try to cover a lot of stories and you try to tell the story in a minute ten and they do. And if you listen to radio news, that's like 680 news and things like that. It's even shorter. And um, so I would say listen to news broadcasts or what, the, what they're saying is, is, you know, the, the writing on news broadcasts. I discovered years ago that Lloyd Robertson, the reason why he was Canada's most trusted journalist was that all of his news items, which he wrote himself, uh, mostly rewrote himself, were all iambic. And you know the, the, what's iambic? The, the iambic meter, um, and it's the rhythm of the heart. And this is why people trusted him. And now the other newscasters weren't weren't iambic. You know, um, he was a poet. And I remember mentioning this in a class, and this student put up her hand, and she said, "Oh," and I said, "What's what 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 what? what yeah, what can I help you?" And she said, "That's my dad." You know, <laughs> and she's gone on to win all sorts of awards, Lisa Robertson, and. Uh, you know, it's, um, I think it's this idea that, that 
good writing lives in the ear. Um, you know, and it's, it's not it's the ear's ability to generate pictures in the mind. And look, the John John uh, McGregor story that I read you, it, it's driven by images. But if you listen to the sentences. There's flow. There's a beautiful swaying of the wind in it. I mean, he doesn't mention the wind, but you can feel the wind, which is interesting. You can feel the wind in the trees, the leaves, and everything. It's um, it's something that really good poetry does too. It captures kind of um, almost a sensual quality of what it is to live in the world. And if we listen to um, to what we write, you'll hear the, the music of the world in in our words, and mm -hmm. it, it creeps in. It wants to be there, and uh, so I know some people, some writers, have taken it out. Um, but it's there. So, anyways. Um, what was the question again? It was like, uh, <laughs> I go off, I, I, my mind is still coming back from the heavy drugs that had me on all last year. Um, it was just, do you believe uh, honing your skills in micro and flash fiction writing improves your writing overall? I think so. But then I started getting, um, I started cutting stuff like my wife does. Oh, yeah, I can go. Yeah. And, but if you're going to write larger things and cut them down, keep a slush pile where you where everything goes. Um, the worst thing to do is hit the delete button and go, oh, I really like that. I should have oh that's usable here. You find a place for it. Just cut and paste it into another file. And so yeah, I do that. I've got piles of files and literally nothing but slush piles in. Yeah. Um I, I do that sort of. I keep like the long version. Yeah. Where all of the mm. it's the messy stuff also remains, but then you can always you know if you cut too much, you know like you, sometimes you can lose too much of the spirit of the story too. Yeah, the soul of it. You can always put it back. You yeah, know? That's, that's the nice thing about, uh, about writing in the computer age. Is you can put it back. You can take it out. The only trouble is that if you keep taking it out, putting it back, taking it out, putting it back, it becomes a, a Sisyphusian task. It becomes futile. So, mm. yeah. yeah. So. Um, this is more a question on how you, what your uh, writing processes are. So basically, how do you approach your short fiction writing? Is it different than when you're working on a longer piece, say? Um, and can you share your process? Yeah, it's, it usually starts with, um, sometimes it starts with, with, a, with an image. Like I see it, I see the story and I want to write the story. Sometimes it starts with, with with a situation, um, it was uh, I, I had a picture in my mind of two little girls. Uh, the mother goes out for an afternoon, and they get into her makeup, and they decorate each other, you know, as you know little kid, kids do. And the mother comes home, and she's had it, it's not stated, but she suddenly understands that she's had some um, she's had a diagno diagnosis from a doctor, and the diagnosis is terminal. And it's she says, I'll never see you this beautiful again. And that's the way the story ends. And I was like, oh, and I thought, what would happen when the mother comes home? You know, and um, so, um, and the little girls bicker and things like that. And that's basically 200 words long. And I like to be able to fit a lot, of, like a world into the story. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of scale to all this. You know, a novel is the recreation of entire an entire world and all of its, you know, slow time sort of discourse and so forth and just the narrative. Um, a short story is a glimpse of the world. A flash fiction is when you look through a keyhole for two seconds and you see that that it's when something yeah. happens. Uh, I like that. And the other thing, sometimes stories start with um, questions of, of, of of, of the geography of a, of a story, something that, that people don't consider is that you've got the, the the range of words you can use, but what 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 goes into a story? And you start thinking about like I I think about modes of rhetoric sometimes, just kind of a, the seven modes of rhetoric, which is, sounds really pedantic, um, but uh, later on I'll read you a, a story, short story, which is about process rhetoric, and. Um, it's, it's anyway, so, so I'll read that to you uh, coming up. But it's so I, I thought about the process, you know, about how something is done and what should you know if you're doing something and so forth. 
Um, I teach the seven modes of, I teach the seven, the seven of ghost of form, former students in the room. Uh, they, uh, I, teach, I teach the modes of rhetoric. I teach Tom um, 1016 at Georgia College. I teach people how to uh, basically solve problems with writing. And W.H. Auden said that writing is problem solving. He says that about poetry. But writing is problem solving. And you can put things on the paper. And you can, you, can, you can map it out. You can see what's going on, see all the dimensions of it. And if you don't, that's a peculiar, that's an interesting piece of writing in its own right. But it reveals certain things. So you're looking at the effect of words. And I'm wondering, I'm always fascinated by the effect of words and language and effect of narrative. And um, so that's where the story starts. I, I keep, I work backwards, you know. I very rarely sort of open up a drawer, like, you know, creative writing exercise, open up a drawer and write about what you see, you know, and I, I can't open the drawer because it's too messy. So <laughs> she knows. Um, anyways, but uh, uh, that um, I find that the, the usually a story comes to me as a picture and I, I see the characters or I meet the characters. And that's for a longer story. In the case of... Um, like it was a story that won an award last year and it was a finalist for an award. And it was about um, a, a Chinese dragon, you know, those dra dra dragon, dance dragon, the dragon dancing, mm -hmm. but it was running through an English forest. And I thought that's really weird. Well, apparently I started doing some research on this and there was in fact a dragon that landed in England. Chinese, the Chinese jump in the late 17th century arrived in England. And what happens? And it's about uh, a bad pursuit and the, about the St. George and the Dragon thing that's going on, people said. It's a very complex story. And it ends tragically, but um, it was it's called uh, uh, Dragon Blood. And it's a form of ink. And it would it happened in Saffron Walden in England, which is which was the English one Eng English town where they grew saffron. And, and until the 19th century, and I got its name from that. So all sorts of considerations. I research longer short stories and it pays to do research when um, historical or otherwise, and you can work in the details. But when you have, we're doing flash, it's hard to get all the details in. So you've got to calculate the moment and work from the moment out. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where stories come from, flash mm -hmm. actions come from. Work from the moment out, that's good. And some of the times they're just oddball things. That, you know. Do do any of you get good ideas in the shower? I get great yeah. ideas in the shower. I just sit there. Yeah, you know, I think it's I think it's the massaging of the scalp and the brain or something. But that's where the stories would come from. I've read something recently that scientifically, water and creative ideas, there's there's something to that. Yeah. Yeah. Even the sound of water can do that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, you know, we, yeah. so um, uh, how I approach short fiction writing, um, I kind of um, mine uh, my past life or even more recent experiences um, might be memories, even dreams, some uh, or nightmares, uh, some flash fictions. I I have. Uh, written um from dreams in fact the one in uh in um in the anthology was from a dream of an ex of a heartbreaking experience i had about 40 years ago and it stayed with me and i began to write about it so anything that is really visceral is is really um is grist for my mill something that is that is visceral that has stayed with me for days or weeks or months or years or decades is very, very important to me because if it stayed with me, it's there for a reason. And so then um, I need to write about it. And very often um, I sort of have some paper on the dresser near the bed and a pen and I'm lying there asleep and suddenly something occurs to me. So I'm up with my eyes shut writing in the dark half the time I can't read it in the morning. Sometimes I can read it. But when I can't read it, I go, well, um, that was not not a good experience. But of course, I have to write them down because um, otherwise, 
uh, this little this little flash will will disappear in the night. So I I actually have lots of notes that I have made um, um, in the night in the dark. Um, and I also uh, walking down the street or going for a walk or whatever, uh, something occurs to me, I'll text it to myself on the phone, or I may be doing something else and I just, uh, an idea occurs to me. So I write it down, just those little tiny moments, which can then turn into a, fra a phrase or a word or, um, or a sentence can actually turn into a story. So um, that's kind of how I approach it. Um, and then when I write, I will maybe go 500 to 1,000 words, and then I'll start clipping it back. And um, that is the most um, necessarily painful part of writing a flash fiction, is the paring down until it becomes this shining, tiny jewel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So now I'm gearing up to write a novella in Flash. I'm very excited about that. I have no idea what I'm doing, but you know, it'll happen. Well, that's that's kind of what Bruce was saying earlier. I think um, writing is problem solving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So any any creative endeavor, as a painter and a portrait artist, and I do all kinds of things, um, I'm always problem solving. Mm -hmm. I think that's what make what makes um, creatives interesting mm -hmm. we see things differently we see um, problems differently um, we can be the biggest pessimist on the planet but we can still solve the problem <laughs> you know we can we can stretch yes. that loony like it's rubber yeah <laughs> from a lot of us you know Plus you're on really heavy drugs and <laughs> last year i spent most of the year on really heavy drugs and uh, i thought obama stole our dog and that was one of the brighter stories <laughs> <laughs> And it, it, it was it was my my mind went into fiction overdrive, you know, and the fictions were really, really was, they were crazy, you know, and, um, you know, I thought there was a force field in the door of my hospital room and there's the washroom door opposite the foot of my bed. I thought it was the CIA headquarters and people were living in there and there were two men that kept going in there in the washroom and I thought they lived in there. I hope you're going to write about some of this stuff. I can't write about it. It's just too <laughs> freaking weird, you know. And uh, but and what happened was I haven't written anything since since the hospital stay, because I think I I I think I might have used up all my um, sort of fictional pixie dust or whatever, <laughs> you know, sort of thing in the hospital. But um, but I learned that that what the mind does. This is this is the way narrative works. And it's the nuts and bolts of narrative. You got three facts, okay? And just, just a little exercise, you can play, do this with your friends. You get three facts. Um, one is uh, I like to eat hot dogs, first fact, okay? okay. Next fact is um, um, I, um, uh, I like to go to baseball games, yeah? So you picture me eating a hot, hot dog at a baseball game, right? So the third fact is I walk my cat on a leash. And you laugh because you think, what are you doing with your cat at a baseball game? You know, the human mind, this is what I noticed when I was on heavy drugs, you know, is that the, um, the, the human mind makes connections between things. It's like, um, you know, you, you're looking for resolution, first of all, it, it's, the, it's at the core of music. And you're looking for connection. And if you can't connect, Man, you go to extreme lengths to connect stuff, including having the former president of the United States steal your dog, you know. And you know, I found up my, my my mother and I was weeping. I said, the mom stole our dog. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's like, oh, okay. You know, <laughs> so you know, the, that but we part of us is part of our brains have a natural impetus to fiction. And most of us keep fiction under control, but the fiction goes completely out of control. It's the weirdest trip. Um, some of the people have said, why don't you write about your hospital? <laughs> Are you kidding? Um, because I, don't, I didn't know what, where the line was between fiction and reality. Um, but, you know, thankfully, I was paralyzed. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't sit up and you know, walk around or anything. But um, it was really, it was freaking weird. 
And uh, I don't want to go back there. And that's why I haven't written the right this year. Fear, fear and loathing of the RVH. That's what you need to write. Well, fear and loathing of the TCH, <laughs> Toronto General Hospital. A nice hospital. And great. They do wonderful things there. I was fine when I got to the Toronto Rehab Institute. I, I started to sleep at night. I wasn't sleeping. And the combination of heavy drugs and no sleep is really, is really quite out there. So anyways, but my liver's functioning. Thank you. So yeah, That's good. Yay. So I think we're going to open the floor to um, questions in the audience. Does anyone here have any questions for these two? Colleen has a question. Um, <laughs> um, how does your work as a visual artist inform your fiction? Does that manifest in how you write? I mean, I noticed the way that you're putting these words in one sentence. I'm curious if you have any words. Oh, totally. Yeah, there is a, an absolute connection between the two. Um, because my paintings tend to be quite detailed. And um, uh, and um, very much like stories in, in, in a painting. There's a lot, always a lot going on and they're figurative. Um, and they, uh, uh, so I think when I, when I um, is it called synesthesia? When I see yeah, yeah. a, what, when I look at something, I can visualize the words, I can visualize um, the relationship between what I'm looking at or what I'm painting and what I'm writing about. So um, in some cases, yes, I would, uh, I would definitely connect those two. And because uh, color is a very important part of my work as a painter, it also, um, it al also uh, has an impact on, on the colors I see when I'm writing. Yeah, I used to, be able to taste colors. Really? Yeah, I'd like. Yeah. I'd walk into a yellow room. And I'd, I'd, I'd go Lenny, you know, like that. Lick the walls. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> well, I never, I never went that far. So, you know, I, I never wanted to sink my teeth into the back of the neck of the boy in front of me. He was like, <laughs> <laughs> a steak or something. But you know, it's it's. Uh, mm. uh, yeah, it was it was a weird thing that that was something that went as well when I was in the mm. hospital. Oh and gosh. They, mm. they um, you know, it, it, it was the trade off. You know, sort of. Yeah. Thing. And um, you know, I struck, struck a bark in my life. Yeah. You know, so yeah. this thing that I had to give up. And so yeah. But um synesthesia was one of them. So, <laughs> so yeah. But oh sorry. Okay. Comment more than a question. Um, if you're having trouble getting the plastics and the sword left, Linda, you said beginning, middle, and end, skip the beginning. People spend way too much time setting everything up. And a lot of the times you can take something that you spent five sentences setting something up and just throw it in as part of a sentence describing someone or an action mm -hmm. very, very specifically. It will tell you everything that the, the five lines did. So mm -hmm. start, in, start in the middle of it from there and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. so Carrie is saying um, skip the beginning and do middle to end for, for just getting... Right down to brass tacks of a splash. There's a literary principle called immediate race, where you get dropped in the middle of the action. Homer does it with the Odyssey, and you know a lot of writers do it where they drop you right into the middle of the action. It's like suddenly finding yourself uh, sound asleep on a bus and a commuter <laughs> bus, and suddenly you're in the middle of the highway, sitting there, and the cars are whizzing by you, and so that's immediate race. So that's mm -hmm. it, that's fair game. Mm -hmm. um, did you want us to read something? Sure. Does anyone else have any questions? I just want to ask. Oh, okay. Colleen's well, got one. If we're talking about starting in the middle, when you're going through the process, is you do regular things and just talk about it? You can play around with it. Play around with it. That's what cut and paste is for. You know, I, I often um, start with the last, oh, I, I start with the last paragraph and I work my way back to the beginning. I, I did. I've mm. done that recently. There was mm. a story about a, an old man who uh, uh, was trying to raise championship hens uh, yes. because he, uh, he he want, he's, his farm is over mortgaged and so forth, and um, it, it's called the hens. And I th I don't think it's in this book. I think it's in the one that's coming out in the fall. 
but it's I I had the section, so I, I thought, oh heck, if I turned it upside on its head, and that, that's fair game. Again, it's part of that notion of play. You know, nothing you write is carved in stone, so be willing to make sand a sandcastle. You know, um, you know, out of the whole thing, it's uh, uh, it's part of the notion of play. Mm. All right. Anybody else? Anybody online have any questions? You should be able to unmute and ask away. No, I don't see anybody. <laughs> no one's rushing. That means we had a really good conversation, I think, about writing flash fiction. Um, yeah. So if you want to do your readings, you want to do it from here or the podium? I don't know. I haven't been to the podium in ages. So okay. Oh, okay. Let me shift it over. It's calling to me. So Guys, just uh, give us a second at home there. Hopefully nothing falls out. Absolutely. It'll fall over. Yeah. 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 If I go over, I'll grab the cord. <laughs> there we go. Okay, there we go. Okay, this um, th this is a story about it, it, or whatever it came from. Um, it came from the modes of rhetoric. There's seven modes of rhetoric, which is uh, persuasion, process, classification, which is all about defining things. Um, persuasion is about you know talking someone into something. Process is how you do something and getting all the steps right. Um, cake mixes, for instance, always have process rhetoric on the side of them. Classification is like defining something and giving all the possibilities that fall under the definition. Uh, comparison and contrast, which is the ch Pepsi challenge. And I'm the man who killed blue Pepsi, by the way. Um, the um, uh, Then there's uh, uh, oh, cause and effect, which is the whole insurance business and police work and so forth. And then there's illustrative, which is travel writing, and narrative, which is basically fiction. So this is um, a piece of process rhetoric, and it's titled How to Draw a Frog. Successful artists ensure the frog is not dead. A live frog adds a degree of verity to the drawing process. The artist must be quick to capture the impulsive movements of the subject. Frogs are easily distracted. Inert, docile amphibians are best but hard to find. Avoid dead frogs. They lack something, not just their lives. That goes without saying. They lose that glint in their eyes. They're easier to work with, but are specimens rather than subjects. The veracent depth of their green fades. If a frog is dead, too dead, the drawing is no longer of a frog, but of something returning to the mulch the bottom of the pond. Such frogs aren't satisfactory subjects. Some artists find success by, by capturing frogs in their habitat, but if the creatures, frogs and artists, are handled too aggressively, terror ensues. Everything has a level of delicacy both artist and subject must respect. The best frogs appear happy with their circumstances. Happiness is, is difficult to detect, but the longer a frog is studied, the more its happiness becomes apparent. Keeping a frog happy is hard work. A good artist must put a smile on the face of a little green Mona Lisa. Keeping company with other frogs is not enough. The best practice, practice is to raise a frog from a tadpole to a complete frog, so frog and artist can trust each other in a lasting bond where a happy artist draws and a skilled frog poses. The other one I'll read you is, a, is basically about um, that long. And it's called Hyla Smiles. I collect old cameras at flea markets. So I set aside some of my days in Paris to search them out. I bought a pricey Duarte. The film was still inside and someone feared it might open. So they tied it shut with string, piercing a cardboard note that read, 
le dernier été de Haïla, uh, Hila, um, juillet 40. Once home, I went to my dark room and carefully developed the brittle film. The emulsion still held its image in the hidden silver, and I sat down and wept as the prints emerged from their chemical bath. A young woman is smiling and sitting on a wall beside the sand. She points at something that has startled her beyond the image's frame, and with the other hand, she shades her eyes from the light so we cannot see into the future. You're little like me. Maybe they'll do it. I'm trying to do it so we don't see the monitor so much. Yeah, Make sense? There you go. Okay. I'm going to read Breakfast at the Aristocrat Palace Executive Motor Motel. <laughs> The smoke of the forest fires drove me south from Pickerel River. I left my lover back there. We'd broken up anyway, but he refused to leave. By the time I got to the outskirts of Perry Sound, night was coming on, and the only place with a vacancy sign, red and hissing, was the Aristocrat Palace Executive Motor Motel. The motel had a tilting balcony and chipped concrete columns. Somebody was sweeping gravel into the darkness. I was greeted by a woman with bare feet and glowing teeth. She promised a sumptuous breakfast cooked by grandpa and led me through a peeling hall. Oops, there's grandpa now, she said, blue jay naked climbing in the shower and through a door I saw grandpa, bent, ancient, toothless, helped by a tall boy. As the water poured over him, Grandpa began a series of ritualistic gestures. Hey, no peeking, the woman said. At the end of the parking lot, I saw overflowing garbage bags and a butcher's block piled with roadkill. An incinerator fire was burning. That's where Grandpa does his cooking, my host said. Just you wait. Laughing, she walked off and called back. All will be revealed. The floor inside was littered with cockroach bodies living and dead. A lonely bed, high and narrow, teetered at the end of the long room. Gray carpet halfway up the walls. I hate it here, I said to the room. I thought of my lover yelling as I pulled away and called him. He was somewhere on the highway in somebody's truck. I gave him the address. We had to wrap our arms and legs around each other to keep from falling off the bed and landing on the cockroaches. I thought of the current running through the hissing, red hissing sign, running through our bodies, jolting our lives together. At dawn, I woke to a delicious smell. Later, a knock at the window, an enthusiastic announcement of breakfast. I stepped through the door and my lover said, where are you? And I said, on the other side. And he came through. Everything's like the sunrise, he said, primrose colored. It was true. Even the walls were gold washed, no longer pitted and peeling. Grandpa stood over the incinerator, arms like wings in flight, as he stirred and tossed, sliced and caressed, and mounds of wild onion tarts appeared on the platter, bowls of blackberries and plums, blue shelled eggs, sauces, sauces and jams, ducklings stuffed with sorrel and forest leeks and our host came up behind me and said through her luminous teeth what did I tell you as my lover and I ate the feast ignited the cells and tissues of our bodies suddenly naked an acknowledgement of what we might make of our braided lives together or apart all is revealed the woman's voice laughing from the halls my lover and I seeing each other river deep our sight lines traveling along a strange ancient love. The motel in question uh, is in Perry Sound. Um, <laughs> and I borrowed the name. It's it's it has several names, but I, I I sort of put a few names together. One was the Aristocrat Palace Hotel in Skopje, Macedonia, where I was there for a, 
uh, for uh, uh, an artist uh, meeting. And then there was this other joint in Perry Sound. And really, um, parking lot, garbage, um, incinerator, garbage bags, it's all true. And the old man in the, in the shower was true as well. He was crawling into the shower and his grandson was sort of hoisting him up and getting him over into the uh, under the shower head. So like that comes from an experience um, four years ago. Oh yeah, and there were forest fires. The forest fires up in Northern Ontario a few years ago. Um, we were staying at this lovely place on the French River and suddenly we wake up to a bright day, can't breathe, all the, the, the uh, smoke is getting in our lungs. Uh, my friend and I drove to try to find the fire. We thought it would be exciting, but they popped, turned us back. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's where that story came from. <laughs> Eric knows he was there. <laughs> Not exactly described, but... So op open mic is open. Uh, so. So, Carrie, you want to say something? Um, just one thing first. Um, a lot of people during COVID, their attention spans went like this. A lot fewer people are reading novels. The, the publishing industry has realized that, and that's why that flash fiction is really popular. Mm -hmm. So, keep an eye out for publishers who are looking for people to submit. Search online. If you follow Bruce on Facebook, he's always posting things. Uh, publishers need the material. Even if you don't think you're that good, mm -hmm. send them in. Send 10 and you have a lot of them. They're short. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really important. And if you're just starting out to getting published, if you get published with flash fiction, it, it's, worth, uh, it's worth doing. The only thing to watch out for are the competitions, like a competition for entries. If they're charging you $25 an entry, for they're sure. probably making money off of it. You're not. So mm -hmm. just be careful and you're not going to kind of get scammed or upset, which is. Kind of the way publishing works a lot of the time. Yeah. yeah. So open mic. Um, who wants to go first? I know I've got some. Oh, here we go. I'm just going to shift this so we're not seeing the uh, the monitor too much. A little bit there. There you go. Come this way. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jack. Uh, this first piece that I want to share with you tonight is a result of uh, Bruce Meyer, actually. Um, in my early stages of writing, I was introduced to Bruce Meyer as someone that I should look forward to, get encouraged by, be inspired by. And this is about the person who actually did introduce me to Bruce. Um, I attended his readings. I went to his um, open mic when he was at the Unity market. Um, I uh, was also present when you did the honorary uh, presentation for Donna Douglas when she won the Entrepreneur Award of the Year. Oh, okay. okay. And this I wrote for Donna, which I presented to her, being inspired by you at the uh, one of my last. Yeah. Okay. Um, she offered a, a, a thing called Go Venture it was a course like teaching someone how to be in your own business. And at the end of it, uh, she produced you with a plaque that said, my dream, my reality, that you hung on your wall. So this is the title of this piece. It's my dream, my reality. If you have a dream and don't know where to go, there's a friend in town that you should know. Come as you are, for that's, for that's what's going to count. She's a friend with a flair to guide your paramount. You sign up for the course, come out strong in force. But don't despair if you forget, more important is that you met. Whether it's accounting, advertising, business and bookkeeping, customer service, marketing, money or leasing, legal promoting or public speaking, you'll come out wiser when you are leaving. It may be what she's taught that gets you through the clutter, but soon you will learn it's who she is that's really going to matter. The tool she uses, the experience she has outside the box, unique with great pizzazz. It's her gift, you see, her passion, her calling. She's spirit-driven, sharing and caring. Professional and encouraging is her key. She inspires with honesty and integrity. 
If you have a dream and still wonder where to go, there is a friend in town you really got to know. She's the one with the heart that's full of sincerity, a goal in mind to help make my dream my reality. Her name is Donna Douglas, just to be for sure. So this is the result of the All right. Yeah. This next one, I don't, you know, ideas come from just about anywhere. And this one came to me as a result of talking with my work colleagues. I don't really watch the news. I find news to be very negative reinforcing. So I, I tend to stay away from it. But they brought something to my attention, AI, artificial intelligence. So my mind just immediately went to work with it. And I sometimes have a different point of view than most people. So this is my little article on AI. It's actually called Wake Up Call. AI, a generation's future curse still untold. What mayhem and suffering yet to unfold? Without a heart to guide it right, the only course is self-destruct. You were flawed from the beginning, your intelligence rooted only by definition. You can't help but to repeat the past when void of purpose as history forecast. You are to be used by favorable and unfavorable forces alike, and it is the dark source which I will dislike. A wall of steel, impenetrable and perhaps indestructible, when you cease to be less artificial, more alien and maleficial. The only good is that you prove creation before evolution. But, but what course could I possibly have but to destroy you before you destroy me? As it is said, from dust you came and rust you shall become. Wake up, world. Please wake up. Man. I wasn't sure about flash fiction. It was a term that I never understood. So I don't write black fiction, flash fiction, but I'm pretty sure I told a lot of flash fiction in my life. <laughs> um, when, I, and did, when I did the Google search, it showed the, the number count as you first introduced it. And I was uh, the one that said there was a famous six word story, six word story, impossible, impossible. I know. But I took the challenge, so I wrote one that came close. I call it The Accident. Hey, yeah, you okay? Yeah, you? Fine. <laughs> there must be available to us new writers, not young writers, new writers. <laughs> Anybody else? Come on, Bruce. Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We're limited by. All right. So, um, the first story I'm going to read is one I read a couple months ago. But there's different people here, at least some different. Some of you have heard this. But I, I brought the picture, and I'm also going with the advice to just be ruthless chop it cut stuff out and uh, so story for those who are here uh body art the end yeah <laughs> uh, i am going to do that uh this uh i'll do three very short stories uh the first one is called body art and uh it came from a contest back in 2016 time frame uh, where stories would be written based on art. Uh, so this was one, it, the piece of art is called The uh, the Fascinator and it is by Toronto artist Sally Thurlow and the photograph is by Ian. Show uh, Ah, yes, okay. So I'll show you and then I'll hold it up higher and show the panel as well. You can see it as, Interesting. Okay. It looks like AI. Yeah. Yes. So here's here's the story. <clears throat> Few of the original strain remain, fewer every year. Genetically modified, our resistance to disease is now inbred. Parental options are extensive. 
post-birth alterations unlimited and for the most part unrestricted. Regulations, however, do not allow the removal of the individualistic nature of our brains, so creativity, innovation, and subjectivity flourish. While plastic and ink enabled our ancestors to sculpt and paint their exterior, gene manipulation addresses the complete being. Self-expression has become rampant. Some view us as freaks, others as living, evolving works of art. The vanguard has always felt scrutiny. But it made the long list. This second one I did off the same thing. So these are prompts. Is uh, the first one will be in my book of short stories, which will be coming out later this year. Um, this one wasn't in it, but I don't know. I'm thinking of putting it in anyway. Uh, so this is the piece of art. It's a, it's also a sculpture, and uh, it's two fairies. There's a small one right at the bottom looking up at the, the larger fairy. And it's uh, called Fairy with an Attitude, uh, sculpture by Anja Koistra. Both of these are Canadian uh, artists. So this is, a, this is a little silly, but it's under, uh, under 100 words as well. In fact, it comes in at 63. It's called uh, Fairy Good Advice. You are still young, little one. Always have faith in your abilities. When it is time to climb, never give up. Your spectrum of wisdom will deepen with each level you attain. Today's life may hold tears, but never fret, never fear. Grow and nurture. Truth will envelop you. Pain will disappear. Your memories will contain joy once you embrace your higher L. <laughs> so, that, so that was just for fun. This last piece, and there's no paper. Uh, this started out as the first chapter of what was going to be a novel on incarnation or something like that. And I ended up liking it and chopping it down and it just stands on its own. So this is 250 words. But just, just to complicate the whole thing of what is flash fiction, that short stuff they used to call nano fiction and or micro, and this was called postcard fiction. And so, yeah, let's just call it, call it flash fiction. It's so much easier. <laughs> this is called The Artist. The dull ruby teardrop trickled down the surface of the painting. Its trail cut through the black plume fedora and across a dispassionate face illuminated by a fire's glow. Having lost too much of itself on its journey, it came to rest above a child's golden head. There it stayed, a worthless drop of life on a priceless piece of art, a natural blemish damaging a lifeless ornament. She removed the crimson-soaked scarf from her slit wrist and sourced another flow of blood under the most precious of her lord's secret treasures. As it settled near the fire's heart, she pressed a thumb firmly on each drop, thus leaving the only signature she had. Her head tilted pensively. She stepped back from the easel to better assess her work. Then, careful not to damage her signature, her bloodied hands pressed back into the canvas. She smeared, the, her, she smeared her pigment as deeply as possible into those of the original artist, trying to make the two inseparable. Satisfied, she raised the silk of her full gown from the stone floor and walked across the hall to the massive oak doors. They yielded to her push, allowing her access to the dark and frigid winter's eve. After pausing to adjust, she strolled a short distance into the forest. No longer a part of his collection, she lay down and became one with the stillness of the night air. This time, her escape would be successful. Who else has sat right in front of an open mic? Now we got you. You went at the back there. No, that's Mike. Okay. <laughs> oh. 
Okay. As I said in the past, I <clears throat> I like writing in metaphors because I like hiding stuff and I want the reader to think about it and maybe even have to reread it to capture what's there and even maybe invent what they understand out of it. This first piece is called Be the Seed. And I also like when there's a hidden message. So a lot of my writing goes in that direction. When good deeds are often are offered to the intention of others, many harbor hope that these will be reciprocated or returned to them in some way. I wish for my kindness and care to emanate as far away from me as possible so as to create a wave of which I need not be aware. I need only to deliver what's in me, for I am not the way. I'm not the means, nor am I the reason. I'm merely the seed. Let it fan out untethered. Let it find its own life through new eyes on new winds, let it find fertile ground in new hearts and spirits willing. Every seed has but one mission and one purpose for its life. Its fulfillment is unveiled solely in the flourishing of the goodness inside and the joy that is brought in its delivery. So in a couple of weeks ago, I did say, I mentioned that I was also a singer and that I was, I was really fascinated through the paleontology of voice and singing and the development of that through the ages. I wrote this one, <clears throat> a vocal inheritance. Ancient sounds evolved symph symphonically into manifestations of the spirit the unrehearsed compulsive longing of the secret subconscious self, genetic expressions of a deeper presence heard through divine internal design, then projected out with complex evolving biology to embrace and share the instinctual harmony of life. An internal offering echoed across the ages the ultimate universal harmonic code passed on through evolutionary trials in cacophony and the perpetual yearning for deeper congruence. An inherited gift to soothe by imbuing the whole with internal rhythms and tones that resonate through, then dissipate into thin air only to reignite in the reality of another life's consciousness completing the integrity and the depth of all levels of its existence and its truest self, a magical connection with all creatures who vibrate and communicate through sound. Revitalized is the soul when melodious tones dance on the vocal cords, envelop the lips and invade all aspects of the living self, the living space, only to exalt what joy is swaying in the winds of the mind, the voice of one only heard by the one, soon was to be two, to the ears of but a few, then joined by so many in joy and harmony, creating a chorus of voices, resounding ode to humanity. And uh, I'll leave this one for next week. Or we have another one right in there. Yeah. The last one. Yeah. I was sad about that. But so this one occurred to me not that long ago when I started to read, or people invited me to read, and you would get mixed reactions, right? Because some people feel uncomfortable with listening to poetry or they're just not familiar with poetry and stuff like that. And <clears throat> It occurred to me that 
there's a certain amount of education that comes through being uh, exposed to beautiful poetry and in, intriguing poetry and stuff like that and and people change their minds so <clears throat> this is from the perspective of the uh, the listener it's called not there yet oh no he's bringing out his notebook again <laughs> and he's going to make us listen to his poetry again every time we have a family gathering and we're with friends, he decides to turn us into his audience and he never asks if we actually bought a ticket. Of course, one time he did at the beginning when he was unsure that we would like it or even understand it for that matter. What an ego, like he's better than us because he writes poetry. But that first time we clapped and congratulated him and basically gave him this belief in himself. What a mistake. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, it's not bad. Well, some of it's not bad. <laughs> I heard he's even joined a club of poets. What the hell? Oh, here he goes, total silence in the room. Uh oh, okay, uh, that's pretty good, kind of witty. And now the serious stuff, like he's going to teach us something about life. I won't say arrogance, but why does he think that we need to hear this? Like we're not smart as, as smart as he is or insightful as he would put it in his big words. When is he going to grow up and do something productive? Oh, no. Now grandma's got tears down her cheeks. That's not right. <laughs> Why would he make an old woman cry? Okay, here's the end. And hmm, that wasn't bad. I guess I'd better clap and go over and say something nice. That's what I hate about all this. Telling my brother that he did good when I wish. I wish it were the other way around. I guess if I'm honest with myself, I have to admit that I'm a bit jealous of him. He's always been the smart one, always had a way with words. I guess I'm really the one with the problem. Maybe I'm the one that's going to have to grow. Otherwise, I'm just going to fall further behind and my resentment might just get worse. I guess I've got some work to do on myself. I'm not there yet. Okay, do we have anyone else for open mic? We do. Yay. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's come around this way. Oh. Sorry. Hello, everyone. I'm Eugenia. And it's my first time here. Not here, but at the open mic. And um, I, I wasn't thinking, I didn't read about the flash fiction or anything so I just brought something I had okay so it was just Easter and um, it is spring flowers blooming etc so this is something I wrote years ago about this time okay it's called Gethsemane gateway to Easter without my cross would there be a resurrection without Calvary a garden without my tomb a womb of life, without the dark, my glory, without my shame, fame, without doubt, a hope, without my loss, would I have gain, without my pain, would I have a name, without confusion, would it all be made plain, without the dusk, would there be a dawn, without lack, would there be a cana and my new wine, without death, would there be life without morning? Would I have the morning? Without my long winter, would I have spring? Without the frozen earth, flowers of every hue? Without ashes, beauty? Without hibernation, would I spring forth? 
Without my long dark night, could I possess my brand new day? Without death to self, could I bring others with me? Without my Gethsemane, would I have victory? This one is an extract, and um, this portion is called Calvary's River. A solitary sparrow whisks its way across the darkened morning sky. Its sharp and lonely cry left a shudder in the heart of the listener. Down below, the owl of the carpenter was stilled. The usual sounds of business of the previous day could only be heard like an imaginary echo much as the sound of the bird flying past. In fact, that morning, it seemed only echoes were evident. The whole world waited with sadness and longing and ache so deep, it seemed the highest hill could not fill. The world waited, paused in time, to mark the only event of its kind. Never before, never again, would there be a day like this. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, this section is called Doubt No More. Thomas, why do you doubt? Lord, you know me. You know how hard it is for me to believe anything. I saw you heal the sick. I saw you raise the dead. I saw you heal blind eyes. I watched you unplug deaf ears. I watched as the dumb man spoke. I saw the cripple walk again. I saw the leper cleansed. I saw you do these things. Lord, but when they killed you, they killed my hope. It was though all that you had done was in vain. My own heart was pierced when they stuck that spear in you. I bled when you bled, and I haven't stopped bleeding. I could never hope again. I'll only believe if I could put my hand in your side, if I could feel the nail prints in your hand. In your, yeah, hand. Anyone else who uh, is ready for open mic? You both. Excellent. Not fancy like everyone else is on my phone. No, that's okay. We get a lot of that here. I'll just make sure you. So I'm tiny. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So this is just me messing around with book ending ideas. <laughs> the television flickered on, static twisting and turning into a shape. A shape of a person. <laughs> Sorry. A shape of a person. A shape of me. Hello. Congratulations, everyone who made it this far. The televised top doppelganger chimed. I felt like all eyes were on me, when in reality they were fixed upon the screen. I'm sure by now you figured out that there's a traitor amongst you. If so, good job. That's as far as you could have possibly gotten. Their mouth formed a grin, my sharp teeth suddenly quite terrifying. The reason I say that, it's probably dawning on you now. The one who betrayed you all, the one who set this whole thing up, is me, I mumbled. This time their eyes turned to me for real. Oh. What have I done? My legs buckled and I fell to my knees. They're going to kill me. I changed my mind. I don't want this anymore. I, I killed them? It's my fault. Holy crap, someone muttered. I think it was the sports gambling girl. No wonder I hadn't bothered getting to know everyone. Maybe deep down, I knew I was the one who was at fault for all this grief. My arms tightly wrapped around my torso as the video continued to play. Probably wonder why I'd bother wiping my own memories and joining you within this game. It's simple. Despair. That's all. The one on screen. No, me. I wasn't wrong. That was the perfect way to describe what I was feeling. Complete and utter despair. I shook and shivered there, yet somewhere I felt weird. I felt excited. I couldn't help but chuckle, and that turned into a full-on laugh. It was all my fault. I caused everything. All the pain that I'd been through, all the pain everyone else had gone through, it had all been because of me. And that thought was absolutely exhilarating. <laughs> do we have anyone online who wants to do uh, anything? And 
one shaking head, two shaking heads. Marilyn? Nope. <laughs> okay. Um, then that leaves us to the very end of our uh, last Word Up panel. Um, um, just a little news. Uh, next, so the next uh, word up is May 11th. Um, Bruce Meyer will return to give us a, a few final words and, and a reading. It's basically going to be, um, sorry, I see all the, all the me's behind. <laughs> it's basically going to be um, an open mic extravaganza. So I want everybody to uh, come and bring your, uh, you know, whatever you uh, have to read for us. Um, We've got Kat Chabot, who's going to come. Uh, she's She's been a featured musician before, um, and she's going to uh, return, sorry, uh, and do a few songs for us. And I think we've got most of the Poet Laureates. If anyone knows how to get hold of uh, um, Damien Lopez, we can't find him. He was our second, very second uh, Poet Laureate. We'd, we'd really like to, uh, to know where he is. Uh, Damien, if you happen to watch. <laughs> let us know. Um, and of course, we have a storytelling masterclass for writers. So it's basically for those of us, like myself, or anyone who wants to improve their ability to read their work. Um, it helps you to learn to fully express your work in your unique voice, uh, and help you to sort of command your space uh, when you're reading it. Um, so that's Tuesday, May 9th, 6 to 9 p.m., and it's $10. It's going to be live and not on Zoom at East Bayfield Community Center on 80 Livingston Street. So you can find out more information about that at wordupberry.com, uh, where you can also sign up for the newsletter or um, you'll hear updated information about our last big event. I um, just want to thank Rhubarb Media uh, for hosting our website, Check Energy for hosting the Zoom, and uh, City of Barrie for their support. And that's it for tonight. Thank you, everybody. And thank you guys at home. Linda, remember? Oh, I was Marilyn. To... Yes. I... Okay, go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to let everybody know who's there and online that there? contrary to what you may have heard or read online, um, the Barry Writers Club has not disappeared. We are still uh, functioning. Yeah. Hold on a second, we, Marilyn. yeah. Um, where's the thing to unpin it? <laughs> We're just going to unpin it so people can see you. Oh, 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 dear. <laughs> Can't see it. Hide self view. Oh, there we go. No, it's uh, remove pin. There we go. There we go. There you go, Marilyn. Okay. Well, as I said, I just wanted to let everyone know that the Barry Writers Club is still ongoing. We've kept it alive on Skype for the past three years. And um, we do not have started meeting again once a month for now, um, the fourth uh, Monday. And basically what we do is perhaps not quite what Word Up does. We, we do have readings, but we like to critique the readings as well. And that should not be scary to anyone. Um, we've all found it helpful. And all of the people who critique, they do it with respect for the, the author, um, kindness and, uh, and sensitivity. So, and the author always has the choice to say to themselves, no, I don't like that suggestion or yeah, that works. So, um, anyone who's interested in coming out, as I said, we are going to be meeting on the 24th of April at the library. And this coming week on the 17th, we also have a Skype meeting. Now, to get on that, you would actually have to contact me. Um, maybe Linda can put my uh, email address on, on the Word Up page. I will do that. And, and then that way you can get a hold of me if you're interested, and I'll get you set up with it. We'll do that. Yeah, everybody's welcome. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Marilyn. Okay. Thank you. That concludes. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. You're now, if it's your first time, you're word uppers. <laughs>